Record. And You're gonna kick us off. Yeah, but I gotta plug back. I am plugging this up with this one. All right, we're gonna finish at it's it's uh, twenty eighteen minutes till. So what time we're we gonna finish? We're gonna finish like at five till or something. All right, okay. go. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on episode one of The Man and the Millennial. We're here to serve you and give you leadership insights and things that you can implement to level up your leadership. We are going to dive right in today. You know, it's interesting when we first communicated to you all a couple of days ago that we were going to be here and we invited questions and you can still send your question. We want you to send your question. Hello at vanhooser.com. When we invited it and people started watching, the, the questions came oh, yeah. we, pouring. Well, not really. We had one. We had one question from a dedicated viewer, Lori in Illinois, asked this question. We're going to get right to it, answer the question, and then get out of here and then wait to hear for your feedback about what we need to do next. I'll say this about the question. The question that Lori submitted is a question that uh, we hear all the time from our clients, whether it's in training sessions, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, keynotes, and so on. Well, let me read the question. Again, Laurie in Illinois writes this question. What can, what can employers who struggle with retention of millennials do to keep them millennials around? They seem to bolt at a moment's notice. We didn't do that at their age, and it frustrates so many. It's a good question, Lori. It's a question, as Allison has said, that we hear often. Allison, I'll let you take the first shot at this, and I'll go from there if you'd like. Sure. So my first thought is we're talking about the man and the millennial. We've got a boomer and a millennial here. And what we're seeing right here is that this question is saying, we didn't used to do things the way that millennials are doing it now. So, Phil, give your perspective on how older generations used to show up in the workplace as far as loyalty to an organization? Oftentimes, uh, in the early days of my career, for example, we, would, we young employees would receive the advice, you just need to get a job, put your head down, work for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and everything will be all right. You'll get a retirement at the end. You'll grow periodically, but don't get in too big of a hurry. Just, just be patient. Well, not everybody believed that then. Some did and some followed that. I didn't happen to be one of those that did. I was in a hurry. I wanted to have my own business. I actually worked for four different companies in my early days of my career before I started this business in 1988. So it's not always been that way, but it is an issue that this needs to, to be uh, contended with. But here's what we need to do. Whether it, whatever the history was, we need to understand that this is a real question that needs real time and attention. I'll begin by telling you at least one thing that you have to do. This is a no brainer. This is without this, you have a no starter. You have to compensate. You have to pay people well. Now, that's always a big issue, bigger than what we're going to take on today. But it, you've got to understand that that employees have got to meet their financial obligations. I, I, I shared with Allison a statistic that I found just this morning. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, as of July, the end of July 2021, put out this statistic, and it boggles my mind. They said that today, today, more than uh, more job openings are available. In fact, 10.9 million job uh, openings are available right now the biggest number ever as compared to unemployed persons. There are only 8.7 million unemployed persons now. If you do the math, 10.9 minus 8.7, we've got a 2.2 million employee uh, uh, benefit in the, uh, for employees that they can go anywhere right now and get a job. And they can get a higher pay. We've got to understand that one way to retain, Laurie's question, one way to retain employees is we've got to make uh, uh, pay fair and equitable. But I think you, both you and I would agree that it's not just money that people come for. I agree. I'll underscore the money point. Like we have to get to a point where we're not playing the money game anymore. The cards need to be laid on the table. What does someone need in order to stay at your organization? That conversation has to be had. And that might mean something different. What they need might be different than what you think they need. Uh, they they may need to be in a different position in the organization for it to make sense on the balance sheet, but money has to be taken off the table. But it goes, as I say that, because 
it all comes back to knowing your people. So we can tell you what, in general, what we're seeing as far as a trend, what works with millennials. But what I know and what I always say is that you have to know people's stories, not just the statistics. You have to know why your people are staying or what would make them even open that text or that LinkedIn message that's offering them something different. And the only way to get to know people is to talk to them, spend time with them. You can't figure them out by just thinking through it. You yes. have to ask the question, why are you here? What do you want? Where do you want to go? How can I help you? What are you struggling with? What do you think your skills are? What do you think your weaknesses are? We have to have those kinds of conversations that will enable us then to help build the future for them or with them. We're not going to tell them what to do. This is the day and time when, when employees have never had more opportunity to make choices on their own, not only because there's a, uh, a huge number of jobs that are available right now, but because the nature of their development. We have encouraged employees, now previously students, but now employees, to explore their options, to think about what the future might be, build the future that you want. And, and they've done it. They've listened to us and they've done that. As you're talking, it just made me think if I was a manager or supervisor in today's work world where people are leaving like crazy, I would ask my employees two questions. I would ask them, what, what is it that makes you stay? And let them give me those answers. Now, you have to know when you start having these conversations, you have to make sure that there's trust respect there, that they're not afraid no to question. tell you the truth. That's a conversation for another day. But I would ask them, okay, what's making you stay? Because then that sort of gives you a roadmap of what you need to make sure you keep doing. But then I would also say, and I heard this question from someone in a really successful fast food industry. They said, what will make money the least important thing you ever get from this organization? And it's that question that makes me think about a survey that I got from a group that I'm going to be speaking to later this month. They did a survey of over a hundred people asking them, you know, what's your pain point at work right now? What would make you leave or what would make you stay? And overwhelmingly the answer came back and they all used the same word. They explained it differently, but they all used the same word. They didn't, or they want to feel supported. And when you think about supported, I mean, that can mean a lot of different Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Supported to me might mean that you pay me enough so that my ki my four kids can go do all the different sports or whatever it is I want them to do. Supported to you might mean what? Supported to me might mean that you're listening to my ideas. Then when I bring them to you, you're not just casting them out. Oh, we've never done it that way. Well, you stick to your knitting. You do what you need to do. They listen to my ideas. They're open to suggestions. And they're even supporting me when, in fact, I tell them I have something going on outside of work yes. that's creating a challenge in my life. So Support can mean a lot of things. Now, leadership does not, or in past time, leadership did not always focus on that particular issue, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't have been. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but in, the, in the spirit of time, we talk about the economic issues, the pay issues. We talk about understanding, knowing them, knowing and supporting them. But there's one other thing that we hear regularly from the millennial or the younger employees that, quite frankly, is different than, than what Lori indicated might have happened years past. And in a simple word, it's feedback. Feedback, specifically regular intentional, uh, uh, ongoing feedback. Typically feedback happens in annual reviews or semi-annual reviews. We're talking about people wanna have an ongoing conversation with their leader. How am I doing? That happens when we were growing up in school, we were getting that feedback through online grade monitoring. We, we were getting that instant feedback of this is how you're doing in this class. We want that in the workplace too. Please don't be one of those leaders and managers like I had as a as a, a, a baby boomer early in my career who said things like this. Well, if I was so bold to go and ask, how am I doing? They would say, well, you must be doing all right. I haven't kicked your butt lately, have I? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't had to have a, that conversation with you lately. Now, they may have tried to be funny or maybe there's a truth in that humor. But a lot of folks in the earlier generations also wanted feedback. We just didn't get it. 
but this generation wants feedback and frankly they demand it yeah. or they go look in someplace else for where they can find it. And there's research to back that up. And before I leave you, I want to say one other thing. From a millennial perspective, and it, not even from just my perspective, we were on a coaching call with a client last week, and they said out of about 24 people, they had lost six. So we're talking six, we're talking 20% of their team gone, and every person left for flexibility, a more flexible schedule. Allison may not be the best mathematician. Six out of 24, that's actually 25%. 25. But, that, but that's okay. We'll work. We'll, you'll forgive her I do her leadership, for that. not math. <laughs> but the reality of it is this is happening in the real world. Now, let me stop here for just a second. We didn't know what, the, what episode one is going to look like. We didn't know how long we were going to take. We knew we weren't going to take over 30 minutes, but we did not want to impose on your time. Hopefully we've done something that will be helpful to you today in these, in these few minutes that we've had. First of all, let me say thank you ever so much to Lori from Illinois for sending this question. And I'm encouraging all of you to send a question, a comment, a topic for discussion that is important to you. And you can do that very simply. Before you log out, before you even turn us off right now, hit the, uh, send an email, email to hello, H-E-L-L-O, at vanhooser.com, V-A-N-H-O-O-S-E-R. Hello at vanhooser.com. Send us the message. We'll collect them. We're going to try to address as many of them in the days, weeks, months, and episodes ahead. And you might remind them again when our next episode is. Sure. It's in uh, on September 24th, 10 o'clock on LinkedIn. We may be live. We may be recording it. Either way, we're coming to you to bring you value. So he's the man. Wait a minute. One other thing I got to say. You know what tomorrow is? Yes. Tomorrow. September the 11th, 2021. It was 20 years ago tomorrow. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't take just a minute to acknowledge the, the changes in our world that happened as a result of that horrible day. Now, we can focus on the negatives. And, and you know, there were many negatives. Almost 3,000 people lost their lives. But I prefer to focus on the positive. I prefer, prefer to think about those heroes that, that rose to the occasion, those first responders, the firemen, the law enforcement professionals, the EMTs, and the hundreds, countless number of volunteers that came to, to dig through those wreck, that wreckage and to help and to encourage uh, lives that were taken and those that were remained to help them along the way. I uh, am so happy that we live in the United States of America where we enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. I'm so happy to know that I'm around people and, and, and uh, uh, neighbors with people that will rise to the occasion when other people are hurting. I want those who are thinking about 9-11 and this 20th anniversary to know that we are among you. Uh, we, are, we love this country and we are so thankful for God's blessings on this country and we're thankful for you watching and participating with us here today. Remember what she just now said. She is the millennial. I. He is the man. And we will see you all on September 24th. Thanks for being a part of this first episode with us. Bye-bye.